Welcome to another dimension, a dimension of insight, a dimension of understanding. You are entering a place where reality collides with truth. There are no limits, there are no boundaries. This is off planet radio. It's us. It's Off Planet Radio. Somewhat on world. Feet planted terrestrially on the ground. Speak for yourself. Okay. Not so much. Hey, well, so today might be a sharp contrast to what I normally do. But we're going to go over a couple of fundamentals today. And one of them has to do with the gift that just keeps on giving flat earth, round earth, and what the fuck do we live on? <clears throat> and the reason I bring this up, uh, a friend of mine on Facebook asked me last week why I put inverted quotes around the word space when I post about it. And so um, I've never, I had people ask me repeatedly to put some kind of like really focused response to what we think the construct, the matrix, the thing we live on is. And, I, and I've often said it's kind of scattered like seashells on the beach across a lot of different shows because it's kind of an ongoing riff. But maybe we can make another run at it today and kind of give listeners, viewers, some kind of consummate statement, at least a, a, a statement of, uh, I hate to say faith, belief, I hate that. Um, perception, that's better. It's current understanding. Current understanding, yeah. It's an evolving, but it's evolving out of a very different space than what I think most people out there are trapped in right now, which is the prevailing and conventional wisdom of the earth is this ball or this, this flat shape. So my answer to my friend on Facebook, which was, a, which was a private message, and then I posted it out along with a link from motherboard.com's article on the, on the cosmic ray shooting out of the ground in Antarctica. And um, <clears throat> we'll go into that after I do this. So I'm gonna read my statement. And I basically responded to him and I said, I hold a view that what is called space by Copernican, Galilean, Newtonians is inside the realm of what we call Earth. That all objects in space can be accounted as much smaller and much closer than is presently believed or stated. That Earth is not a planet, but a continual plane which has both a lower and upper strata. The upper strata, or what is called space, is within what we would call the firmament, or the, we'll call it the dome. I go on to state, I'm not a flat earther or, or a ball earther, but what we inhabit is an electromagnetic toroidal field, which appears both flat and spheroidal. What is called outer space is what ancient texts called the deep, and portals are accessible through water, not the sky. That realm is interdimensional. Understand that physics is a very limited, specialized science that works on known forces and properties. It would not scale beyond this dimension, which was the point of posting the article about cosmic rays in Antarctica. My understandings are based in metaphysics, not general phys physics, and that we have been deceived about our dwelling on this realm, largely to limit consciousness and to hide the virtually limitless system on and in which we inhabit. All the images shown to us in the media as space by NASA are CGI fabrications and optical convex lenses create spheroidal objects at long distances due to limitations of lens physics. So that's the statement that I made about that. 
your comments, your thoughts. Uh, did you, um, well, when we, on, on, on round one, when we tried to do this, you, you brought up the motherboard article. I didn't know if you wanted to do that. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm pretty much uh, in agreement with everything that he just said. Um, you know, yeah. I mean, I think okay. if Earth is, is flat around, it's a, you know, I think there's a disc and a toroid and uh, then, you know, the sort of conical in and out through the middle of the toroid, you know, that is the same thing that functions as what people think is the holes in the top of the poles, you know, right? The holes, the poles and whatnot. Um, I think we live in a, I think, but I also think it's a hologram and a projection of our own minds. So we have, a, and, oh, we're, yeah. and oh, it's a realm, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. it's like a lot of things going on at once. And um, all of this necessity of both the powers that be and the plebes to have it be either round or flat. Because I actually think the, the powers that be don't care if people think that the earth is flat, right? I think that's a psyop that they actually care, right? And they, the whole point of this, like everything else, is to keep people in either or thinking as opposed to both and thinking because all of the answers lie in the both and. So, um, well, it's the enforcement of a construct, it's the enforcement of the shape of the object. And the real power in doing this definitionally is that they get to define boundaries, not just the boundaries of the physical area itself but the boundaries of consciousness. How you're allowed to think about it, yes. Because when we give things names, words, we give them power. Mm -hmm. Almost everybody that's studied things like neuroscience, advanced psychology understands the power that comes when we name something. This, is, mm -hmm. this even goes into identity politics this and goes why. Into pres prescriptions and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just, you're right, right. I mean, why? In written, why written law. In law. I mean, they patent, they copyright all of these terms because they want to own them, which means they then own the mental landscape that is created by these words. This is really the essence of a very high form of witchcraft, which goes into word spells and sigils and all the other things that weave this web around us. Yeah, no, I mean, that's absolutely correct. I think of the flat or round, it knows different than the right or the left, right? Like it's, it's red and blue, it's either or, right? It doesn't leave any, um, it's polarization, right? It doesn't leave yeah. any room for the space in between or the space outside or the world beyond the poles, right? There you go. It doesn't the leave beyond the poles. The, yeah. Right, right. So the space in between is our biggest, the space between the poles is where any interesting conversation about what might exist outside the poles can happen. And they don't want any of that. Everything has to be right, left, polar, flat, or round. It can't be, you know what I mean? Like, it has to be that, so. So somehow in the 20th century, they defined all of this. And first off, the enforcement of the sphere Earth was propagated by the placement of globes everywhere mm -hmm. in the classrooms. I mean. Well, go into anybody's house, especially anybody that's had children, mm -hmm. and you will find a globe there. Mm -hmm. Because the spatial enforcement of the spheroid Earth object is how you create the simulation inside the mind, which allows it to then begin to conform to the spheroid object with limited restrictive aspects. Mm -hmm. If we're told... It's also the first step in creating the sphere being alliance, just so you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there is that. I mean, you gotta start young, right? Well, if these guys were such rebels, why are they conforming to to the constraints that were imposed by uh, 19th and 20th century science? Right, yeah. I mean, <laughs> what a bunch of morons, frankly. Yeah. And it continues. I mean, it's a gift that just keeps giving Don't because bring. most of the alternative media in its slavish insistence on certain forms is also reinforcing the same construct. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would rather be extravagantly wrong in speculating about what I think our reality is than continue to reinforce the restrictions that have already been programmed oh. into us. That's kind of the point of what we're doing. That was the genesis behind Off Planet Radio. Th that's which 
that's how I feel about everything. Like even, you know, like there's some people that I enjoy listening to that I disagree with, but I like the way they're thinking, yes. the way they're putting together their process of yes. how they get to what they think is going on to me is, is yeah, free thinking, individual thinking, unique thinking, right? So even if I think they're dead wrong, their process makes sense to me. And the next thing that they do that to, they may be right on about, or maybe they're right about whatever they're talking about, but I think they're wrong about whatever. But I like people who have, you know, their own way of thinking about things and not just using the standard conformed, you know, conformity way of, do, of arriving at B from A. So, yeah. Well, it's kind of like what you and I talked about <clears throat> the last couple of months that we're sort of at the end of research and knowledge and empirical evidence gathering. We're at the end of information. We're the, at the end of information. Where we go with the information we have now is most of it's a discard pile, a huge one. It's weeding through everything and discarding that which doesn't resonate mm -hmm. with the present understanding of your reality. I mean, if we believe that we are eternal beings, that we're, we are continuously creating by virtue of our imaginations, our thoughts, our words, our actions, then why the restrictions that have been placed on us in terms of our, our reality and our understanding of reality? And why do we continue to operate under the fundamental sciences created over 500 years ago, based strictly on the optics of ground lenses viewing supposedly very far objects? And this was what was being challenged in the worlds beyond the poles is largely the concept that that, that Galilean Copernican view of things was strictly the result of very crude science and physics that, physics that we could utilize, but physics that we also suspect was reverse engineered from the numbers they arrived at based on that, those physics. And so we're supposedly in this advanced state of science. We supposedly, quote, been in space but we still have never seen uh, live video footage of the spinning earth from a satellite from uh, a we've NASA. Never seen, we've never even seen a picture that isn't an artistic rendering or a CGI image. No, uh, <laughs> NASA is a far bigger producer of fantasy themed um, media, bigger than Disney in terms of what it spins out mm -hmm. and the number of yeah. people behind it, most of whom are a support cast of actors, mm -hmm. whether they're scientists or physicists or astronauts, technicians or computer scientists, or astronauts. Or astronauts, hypnotized astronauts. I mean, you can go look at the coverage of Apollo 11 when, when they came back and the press conference was done Neil Armstrong looks absolutely catatonic. Mm -hmm. I mean, supposedly the first man who walked on the moon, and when you look into his eyes, what you see is a vacant stare and a very programmed monologue response what? to canned media questions about this supposedly historical event. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, kind of what it reminds me of in some ways, and, and I was just thinking that maybe the more appropriate term for them would have been they would never go with this, right? This is what it is, is psychonauts who have been, right? Psychonauts who've received a dose far beyond their ability to deal with it and then been, you know, down, you know, but there's interesting, you know, that's the space that they're really interested in, in examining is the, the, you know, the mind space, right? So who has been pumped full of psychedelics, had their mental landscape you know, interrogated and then completely wiped and is just in that, you know, when you've seen somebody who's been like, Got done too many ass too much acid and they have exact that same look that you see on their faces wandered off look in their eyes and yeah it's the same thing yeah 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 exactly and so we have to assume at this point that there's more to hide than there is to reveal from the operations of nasa that basically it's a cover-up operation for what's really going on i mean what happened after world war ii when they started to go into antarctica years after Bird had already gone to the North Pole. And again, very strange statements that emanated from that that were never followed up on. 
And then the Antarctica thing where they basically closed it off, there was an agreement made between, I think, five or six nations, chief among them, the US and Russia, to basically keep Antarctica off limits to anybody outside of these governmental bodies and their sponsored assets. So that brings us to this, the uh, motherboard article that I'm gonna share. And most people have seen this now. It's actually been out there. Um, it's been out there a, a couple of years, yeah? Well, this story is pretty recent. Oh, okay. Um, and this basically, no, it's a dateline on the September 28th. This is fairly new, 2018. NASA went searching for micro black holes in Antarctica. Instead, it detected cosmic rays shooting from the ground, and some physicists think it's ever evidence of a super symmetric particle. What the hell is a super symmetric particle? You see, all of this is is cloaked in jargon. Let's see. Now, this is a group of scientists. I'm going to look up supersymmetric particle. Okay, so on Tuesday, a group of researchers led by Pennsylvania State University. Oh, gosh, there's Penn State. <laughs> this right? is Derek well, Fox. Penn State, where they specialize in, you know, sexual abuse, whatever, later, yeah, which is also later. part of the secret space program. So there we go, yeah. Well, not only that, but it was Penn State scientists that were caught faking the, uh, the, the, the climate change data. That's right. Four years ago. In that whole whole um, gambit. So okay. I mean, in, in in particle physics, supersymmetry is a principle that proposes a relationship between two basic classes of elementary particles: bosons, which have an integer-valued spin, and fermions, which have a half-integer spin. <laughs> so, so now that it's clear, everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's the slicing and dicing. Yeah. Of what we would call the ether. That dude, that thing we were looking at this the other day. That thing right there looks almost exactly like it looks, a stack. It looks exact, almost exactly like a stack of function one sound si uh, on a function yeah. one sound system. Yeah, we've but, talked about that. I'm gonna see if I can bring up a stack of the function one sound system. I think we're getting yeah. somewhere here. This is useful because actually, uh, most of you by the time that you see this uh, will have seen um, the show that we did with Chad Stumpy, where we talked about um, this this body of these bodies. This landmass that sits under Lake Superior, which led us tangentially into the discussion about sound waves and water and how sound waves are reflected and magnify. And All right, you guys, look at this. Hold okay, on. so I'm, I'm going gonna, gonna to show you a variety of, because there's different ways they arrange it, depending on the size of like. Air. Take a look at the, take a look at the, okay, take a look at, where are they all going? Hold on a second, let me show. There's some that look very super, like, um, otherworldly. Take a look at that. Yeah, right? Wow. And yeah, then nice. there's a few, hold on, there's a couple others that are in, oh, I just closed that. What did I just do that for? Hold on a second, can bring it back, bring it back. Let's just go to history. Hip, hip, picture search. There we go. Oh, where did it go? Function. Keep talking while I keep looking. Okay, so there's a lot of interesting, like, uh, scientific aspects to all of this that beg the question, why are they using these great big devices to find so-called micro black holes and cosmic rays in Antarctica? And how does that connect to the fact that Antarctica seems to be this gigantic sheet of ice sitting on underground lakes and, and even possessing like hot springs and things like that? So we don't really understand the that's, topology. That, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the, the image. One. That's the image for their company. Yeah, yeah. That's look at it that. Right and look at yeah. it looks almost exactly like what you're talking about. Yeah, I can All pull right. that back up and pull that back up. now. Yeah, we'll just pull that up and you can get another. And guys, Function One sound system is like, they use it a lot with dance music. Look at that, okay? They use it a lot with dance music and they use it uh, a lot, like a lot of the big festivals and stuff like that, right? And there's been like testing and stuff done on it and it's been 
discuss that this particular sound system is useful in helping somebody have a transcendent experience. Yeah, that's, that's called Anita. Yep. <clears throat> so they asked the question, what did Anita see? First, the Anita mission launched from McMurdo. Wait, it's Bay. called Function One Sound System. So the first function of existence here, of mind control, of blah, 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 whatever, be able to control one's experience through sound. Mm -hmm. That is the first function. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just had to say that when I was thinking it. So we'll go a little deeper here. The first Anita mission launched from Murdo Base in Antarctica in December 2006. The experiment flew to an altitude of about 120,000 feet. <coughs> sure it did. Where it spent a month drifting over Antarctica. It was equipped with sensors designed to detect pulses of radiation produced from ultra-high energy neutrinos, a nearly massless particle with no electric charge interact with the uh, Antarctic ice sheet. Now, my first question is, we put up, we launched a mission, that, an experiment that flew at 120,000 feet. What, they don't have video cameras? We can't see this footage? Did we see footage of this? Did, did they show that to us? Furthermore, there was around this time frame, actually predates this a little bit, around 2004, 2005, one of my contacts was a former Army Ranger who actually did broadcasts with me when I was doing the threshing floor, who told me that he was aware of fleets being summoned to Antarctica at that time, that there was a huge amount of military activity going on in Antarctica sometime in the period between 2004 and 2006. So the same time period when they're launching Anita, there's something else going on. So we'll continue with the article here. I'll just put that in brackets and you can ponder that for what it's worth. In the early 60s, the Soviet physicist Gergen Askarian theorized that when a high energy particle interacted with a dense dielectric medium, a type of insulating material that doesn't conduct electricity, it would produce a shower of secondary charged particles whose radiation can be detected by standard radio antenna. This interaction, now known as the Askarian effect, allows physicists to detect particles that hardly interact with normal matter like neutrinos, by observing their secondary effects. And this is exactly, <clears throat> well, it's very close to the type of science that supposedly produces the radio telegraph images in space as well, and also what's called um, the sounds of space or um, music of the spheres, which is sounds that are allegedly being produced in space. Nothing that's been recorded in space as it's been presented to us is presented in its native format as a graphic image. It is basically a collection of data coming from secondary phenomenon that supposedly emanates from cosmic rays. So the goal of the, the Anita mission was to use an array of antennas to detect the Ascarian radiation produced from high energy neutrinos interacting with the Antarctic ice sheet. Unlike photons, neutrinos don't lose their energy as they propagate through the universe. Oh, through the universe. This means that they can carry information from beyond the photon horizon, the limit that photon sources are still detectable from Earth, and provide a window into the farthest reaches of the universe. Now that whole statement there sounds marvelously scientific. Except that nobody's ever defined the universe, what the universe is, or what constitutes the universe. I mean, we've barely, even by our own cognizance, gotten out of our own solar, we haven't gotten out of our own solar system, even with satellites. We've never gone beyond the limits of our own basic Earth space realm, as far as I'm concerned. So now we're defining the universe by measuring high energy neutrino particles. Furthermore, some models of physics that are, quote, beyond the standard model, see how that is right there. Look at that. Mm -hmm. That's your catchphrase right there. Beyond the standard model. 
So, which, t which should tell you that the, even they are playing with more models, right? So they're allowed to play with more models, just we're Well, they're model building. The right. standard model, and this is an operative phrase here, this is linguistics. The standard model is everything that you already assume that you know about science so-called and how it functions to define your ontological landscape, which is earth, sky, galaxy, and then I suppose the universe. So they basically, they've given you little clues here. Some models beyond the standard model predict the existence of, existence of incredibly small extra dimensions. Some of these theories predict that when cosmic rays interact with ice, this produces micro black holes that open into these dimensions, which could be detected beyond the Ascarian okay, effect. Which to me is evidence that water is a portal and something about water and it's frozen state that's, creates that's a window. Boom, window right that's there. You nailed it. You yeah! nailed it. And they thinking, just told us the truth. Right. I'm thinking about in Fringe when they would go use that mm -hmm. lake near their cabin and, and they'd bring that out. window up, up and they would they had to do it at the lake right? exactly exactly yeah. and it was a frozen lake. frozen over lake yep and where did peter come through at under lake. the ice yep. and up yep. through the water yep from the other side so that's how that's how things come in from quote unquote outer space is they that's what's going on Right when missions are, if there are missions, if there are space missions, they're coming back in through the ice, and that's why they have all that stuff blocked and all that equipment there to receive things coming in from the from under the water, under the ice down there in Antarctica. So, that's enough <laughs> of that article because we just answered it. We just took their own text, sliced and diced it, and showed you our theory of Damn, how we're good <laughs> and how we deconstruct it back and show you yeah they're telling you that and then they're giving you all this babble science about slicing and dicing quantum space so that you think ooh, this is impressive give them more money hmm. yeah boy that was uh we riffed on that we totally riffed on that that was a grateful dead concert right there <laughs> <laughs> they probably have a function one sound system too. Oh, they function one. They okay. actually so they have a sound here, system here's called here's the Lambda. Here's my question: Is that kind of satellite equipment, sound camera, space equipment, whatever, right? Function one sound system. Does it, is that frequency part of the necessary equipment, uh, a necessary frequency generation to allow passage through that? And that's why they have stuff like that there. Like, remember, they, in, in Fringe, they would have all that equipment set up and, you know, look, beam that stuff and whatever. Like, is that, and is that why? I mean, so when I go to parties and I'm dancing, I like, okay, so somebody was asking me last night if I felt like I could have the same experience dancing if I just, like, did it at home or somewhere not at the party with all those people. And I said, well, there's something, there is some, like, level of, the experience that has to do with being around people and the different energies and vibes and whatever. But as far as like my really transcendent spiritual process with it, probably not, but there is something about having the huge sound system and the vibration and the frequency that that generates. Right. And my body, as most of your bodies are mostly water. And so am I needing that level of vibration of my water portal here for it to open up and for me to travel. Right. And so, I think the sound systems are very important. The amount of research that's been done on sound systems, most people don't realize. I actually live here in Pennsylvania where there's a major supplier of concert sound systems. Going back to the 60s, the first company that built stadium level speaker systems is called Clare Brothers. They're located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is just south of me, about 35 miles. The Grateful Dead built their own right, and sound Lancaster, system. The Lancaster is where Amish people are, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And, and it's, also, the, it's also where all the outlet malls are. So what Well, it's also <laughs> where during, after World War II, okay, here's a little local lure. I've spent a lot of time in Let's Lancaster. Let's not go with the lure. <laughs> no, lure, L-O-R-E. Oh, lure, not I thought you lure. said lure. <laughs> like, like, no lure. more lure. Ooh, no. <laughs> Uh, sorry, that's an inside joke. So uh, I spent a lot of time in Lancaster County. I actually was in sales in the 90s 
We spent a fair amount of time in Lancaster, both the city and the county itself. A lot of people don't realize how many projects they ran as side projects during World War II to support the military industrial complex. But as a result of being in technology sales, I actually swerved into a number of businesses that had been around since the 40s supplying various types of um, uh, paraphernalia equipment systems. And as a result of that, had some interesting conversations with people, one of which was the fact that because the Amish are Germanic, they were able to secrete Nazis brought into the country mm. into the communities around the Amish and Mennonite communities in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Mm. Now, yeah. I can't prove I'm, that, but I can tell you that from sense, my perspective, though. it totally works. It makes sense. And, you know, a lot of things that the Amish people do, they, they, their, their cover is that they're low tech when really they're spiritual well, yeah, tech. Right? Yeah. They're spiritual tech. And Nazis would know a lot of stuff about that. So it would be who, you know, like it would be mm, Nazis would know the highest level of that stuff, right? So it would be beneficial for both them looking to hide and the people that they're coming because they can inform. I'm thinking of the X-Files episode where mm -hmm. he went to that community that was, you know, sort of code for Amish community. And they would well, go look at also go if you're, you know, look at the movie Witness. I haven't seen that, but I'm thinking, uh, you know what I'm talking about, the episode yeah. where there's that community where yeah. they're doing this weird stuff where like there's a cave in the ground that has some weird kind of like natural plaster in it and they're basically burying themselves like alive and it's, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Remember mm -hmm. that episode? I need to go back and watch it again. That'll come up, by the way, in a future series we're going to be doing here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. but it's... um. I remember that that was one of the most significant episodes of X Files to me. What is really going on there with these people? And this was this was a secret that they were hiding from the whole world. This was why they were so suspicious of outsiders. They didn't want people to know about what they were doing in there. Um, I forget. It was probably it was sort of a midway along in the series. Like I don't remember what season it was in or what it was called. It would take me forever. Well, we can look it up. But um, we can look it up. Well, let's just tell people. You and I are planning to begin a new series where we're going to go back into Fringe balls deep this time. And so maybe we'll do X Files. We've done this, but Fringe still figures spectacularly into our worldview, and it figures into current events pretty heavily too, because it's basically bridging two dimensionally connected worlds, which comes back to the Antarctica thing and what we think is going on there. That there's a membrane that possibly is it at its thinnest proportion somewhere between um, the Indian Ocean, Southeast Asia, going the whole way down through Antarctica. And let's not forget this. If they put this project in the air at the reputed altitude that they did, I do not, cannot believe for a second they did not launch all kinds of other technical equipment with that, and that they would not have possession of solid evidence that Antarctica is not a continent, that Antarctica is part of the continuous plain Earth, and that it extends beyond whatever they can imagine. I mean, 150,000 miles up in the air, what's the bird's eye view for that? Um, this guy here, let's talk about this for a minute. This is, a, and I'm putting this up because I want people to see the reference. F. Amadeo Giannini and the book Worlds Beyond the Poles, Physical Continual. I need to read universe. it. I haven't read this yet. I need to read it. Um, this book is, is Order important. Order it for me while you're there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <clears throat> this book's important because it's never been refuted. This book was published in the 1950s. So this is a piece of work that's relatively within modern history. And it used a lot of data accumulated from the Navy. Yes, once again, I said the Navy launching the Atlas I rockets into the upper atmosphere. 
and what he found out about the data that was accumulated from the, was it Samson or Atlas? It might've been the Samson rockets. I can't help but think, notice also, I'm sorry to interrupt you, I just, it's hitting me right now. F Amadeo Giannini, and I'm thinking Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. <laughs> <laughs> right? I don't know why I just had to say that. <laughs> but this guy was, a, if you read this book, understand something. However, he ascribes this, and he uses kind of theological terminology. Something about his narrative tells me he was remote viewing. He, in some way, had a sense to know where to look for data. Because he traveled around for, I think, 25 or 30 years before he wrote this book. I mean, he was literally speaking wherever he could be found, everywhere from California to the East Coast. He literally crisscrossed the country, doing the research and making contacts in order to write this book, some of whom were very high-level scientists and theologians in their time who gave him encouragement to pursue this. So this book is important because it will give you a basis to understand how I view and how I think Emily views uh, a lot of the so-called science that we're talking about and why we're cynics about the, the standard narrative of, of what science has given us about the construct that we live in. This book right here should add it to your library. You should read it. You should read it with an open mind. Don't, 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 don't,